You're probably wondering why Devil Jin is my free character in Tekken 6. Well, it's because his level is by far the hardest level out of all the scenario campaign mode. Well, you have to complete the level anyway because there's an achievement in this game where you have to complete every single stage in the entire scenario campaign mode. Yes, if you want to get the achievement, you have to complete every single level in the entire scenario campaign mode, especially the hardest one, which is Devil Jin's level. Hello everyone and welcome to part 2 of Tekken 6. In the last episode, we introduced part of Tekken's history. Plus, we completed the tutorial portion in which we'll never play it again. I know the last episode's video length is pretty long, but I just want to get that over with so we can head straight to the gameplay. Before we continue playing this scenario campaign mode, allow me to introduce you to two new characters in Tekken 6, Lars Alexanderson and Elizabeth Skadovich. Ever since Jin won the fifth King of Iron Fist tournament, everything is causing chaos throughout the entire world. The Machine Saibatsu and the G Corporation are fighting against one another, and the Tekken contestants manages to either stop the war or to continue the destruction. You know, the contestants like Law, Julia, um, whatever Tekken characters that appear in Tekken 6, those characters. Well, it doesn't matter to me because this war cannot last forever. It has to end here and now. Jin is still conquering the Mishima Zaibatsu, but someone has to confront him. And his name is Lars Alexanderson. Lars is a young, charismatic guy who began this coup d'etat against the Mishima Zaibatsu. He's a Tekken Force officer with a physical fighting style and intellect. Well, he's not actually working for the Tekken Force that was in the Machine of Zaibatsu. He was more like the leader of the ex Tekken Force who's going to raid against the Machine of Zaibatsu. More like a hero. Yes, he is the protagonist in Tekken 6. But remember, in the previous episode, the explosion from the Jack from earlier causes Lars to suffer amnesia. So our only objective is to recreate Lars's memory so he can accomplish his opposition of raiding against the machines I bought to, including the rendezvous with Jin Kazam. I'll explain to you about the personality and character in the scenario campaign mode, along with Elisa's personality and character. Okay, now let's talk about everyone's favorite anime like Android, Elisa Boskadovich. Well, Elisa's story is somewhat indirect, meaning there hasn't been much detail about this character. So, her story will connect to her father's story. You see, Dr. Buskanovich has a daughter named Elisa who died from illness. This is where it comes down to the Astro Boy body, and I had to bring that up. So, in Astro Boy, Dr. Tema had a son named Tobio who died in a tragic accident. Dr. Timmer was careless before the accident happened. He cared about much, well, much of his work than, than his son. So, he decided to build a robot that resembles his son, Tobia. Dr. Boskanovich is pretty much doing the same thing like Dr. Timmer, but it's just an excuse of seeing his daughter as if she was a real person to him. Call me curious, but there are a few holes in both Elisa's and Dr. Pascanovich's story. For example, in Tekken 3, Dr. Pascanovich's occupation was to create a medicine to revive his daughter Elisa, so he enters the third King of Iron Fist tournament to search for uh, a sample of blood from the ancient oak. So here's my question. Did Dr. Pascanovich save his daughter with the medicine he created? If not, what was he doing all of a sudden? Was he working with another project or something like that? Guys, I apologize for the curiosity, but the gap of the Dr. Boscanovich's timeline seems kind of bothersome. I mean, there were like so many questions that were left unanswered, but um, it turns out that uh, 
never mind, forget it. What can you do? Okay, well, here's my theory. Dr. Voskanovich is unable to revive Elisa, so he decided to work on another project similar to what Dr. Tim was doing with Astro Boy. Like I said before, it's just an excuse to see Elisa for just one time. And that one time will be the last time. Like, the way I was sighing at um, Dr. Voskanovich's story, it makes it just seems like he's a forgotten character. I mean, don't you just hate it when that happens? I Me, mean, first of all, he got an interesting character like Elisa, but then the story's kind of gibberish and unexplanatory. Like thinking that, like, what? What just happened? What? How? Like, you just. Ah, forget it. All I can say is that you'll definitely know much more about Lars and Alyssa during the scenario campaign mode. But if you don't know who Dr. Boskanovich is, well, I'll just tell you this. He's a Russian scientist who creates bioweapons like Roger and the Jack Robots. That's about it. Alright, now that I have talked about both characters in Tekken 6, which is Lars and Elisa, let's head straight to the gameplay in a scenario campaign. I don't want to explain too much info about both the new characters because I don't want to bore you guys to death. When I meant by new, I meant by the new characters like Elisa and Lars, the one I was just talking about before. But anyway, if you want to learn more about Lars and Elisa, check out the links below the video. I'm pretty sure you'll find as many sources as you can. Anyway, let's go. Okay, so this is the world map of the scenario campaign mode. I really like it how the world map is being structured. Like, it's kind of like Super Mario Bros. 3 where you enter one world to the next by going through panels and panels. But, right here, you had to use the cursor to go through certain places. So, let's enter the first level of the game in scenario campaign mode. I'm 
Ah, poor Lars. I feel your pain, dude. It's very emotional how amnesia can be. Very stressful. But the good thing is, we're gonna get him back for you. Plus, we saw a first glimpse of the first boss of the level. So, let's defeat him. This doesn't look like a research facility to me. You're sure this is the place? Yes, with a high degree of certainty. The area operated as a research facility for G Corporation until approximately five years ago. I took the liberty of scanning the inside and have detected numerous bio-readings. People in an abandoned facility? Something's definitely going on. Let's find out what's up. Please. One little quick note before we move on to the gameplay. Do you see this icon right here next to Lars's icon? Well, that is the first aid kit. Whenever your partner Elisa gets knocked out by the enemies, you need to approach to her and press the A button to revive her. You can only do this once per level. So, if she dies again, well, you're on your own. The only way to get this first aid kit again is either restart the level or get knocked out yourself. So, either way, it's fine. Did I ever mention that there's a timer right there? Yes, if the timer runs out, you've failed the level. It doesn't matter how much health you have, and it doesn't matter how many items you collected. If the timer runs out, zip. Nada. Game over. Unfreeze! Alright, now the real gameplay begins. This is very similar to the Tekken Force from the previous Tekken games. While you're advancing in the pathway, the enemies will pop out of bounds and act as obstacles. So you fight these obstacles by beating them up. <laughs> Sometimes the enemies will drop items for you to collect them. This is mandatory, so you definitely need as many collectibles, chickens, and cash as you can. Elisa will assist you by defeating the enemies, but you have to watch her health as well. She's very new to the fighting mechanics, thus her AI increases further by completing levels and scenario campaign. Oh, would you look at that, the gates close, and then these thugs are gonna run into us and attack us. What are we gonna do? Well, we'll beat them up of course! But anyway, there's gonna be some segments where you can't advance to the next section of the pathway unless you defeat these enemies. So this is like a traditional beat em up game. And Tekken Force has been this way. So, defeat the enemies and then the gate's gonna open. Also, we saw the boss again and I'm gonna read you the description from a player's guide just to give you a tidbit of who they are. I mean, if you haven't played a Tekken game before, well, this is just the information I'm gonna give you. If you wanna learn pretty much every single Tekken character there is in Tekken 6. So, you're welcome. Why are you doing this? You have some kind of grudge against the G-Corp? Go ask the people who came here about that. I ain't part of that party. I've only been using them. Using them? For what? Ha! They were just bait to lure fresh prey like you. Alright, so our first boss encounter is Brian Fury. He's from the United States, and his fighting style is kickboxing. 
Brian entered the King of Iron Fist Tournament 5 to test his newly acquired Perpetual Generator. However, time after time, Yoshimitsu got in the way of Brian's plans. In obtaining the Perpetual get Generator, Brian gained the potential for ultimate power, but being unable to test it resulted in frustration. Brian could not contain his desire for destruction, so he traveled to the world's battlefields, wreaking havoc indiscriminately. He eventually grew tired of the comparatively weak foes he encountered, and craved a real challenge. Finally, the King of Iron Fist Tournament 6 was announced, hungry for more capable prey. Brian headed for the tournament to prove his mettle. His first appearance was in Tekken 3. We encountered a man with an intense affinity for battle. His enthusiasm threatens to stimulate my emotion chip. Once we reached the highway that passes through this forest, we will reach a warehouse complex by the harbor. It should serve as an excellent source of information. Oh, would you look at that? Since we've unlocked Brian Fury, we can participate in the arena. Well, we can't go there just yet because there are so many Tekken characters that we need to unlock in the scenario campaign mode. Also, Lars and Elisa cannot participate because their stories tie within the scenario campaign mode. So, 
We just need to continue to the next stage unless we unlock the character that we want. So here's the entire world map in case you're wondering. Alright, so now that the exploration of so much negative space in this world map, everything's all black through the edges and stuff like that, let's head straight to the South Bay Warehouse area. I wonder what character we'll encounter next. Hmm, might be something that people were expecting. Not the most pleasant place I've ever been to. Detected in a warehouse ahead. Let's check it out. All right, so here's the South Bay warehouse area where the sun looks like it was rising while Lars and Lisa are chilling in the shade. And oh my God, I forgot the warning about this level. Please do not, I repeat, do not fight the enemies while you're near the edge of the concrete. If you fall or the enemies knock you off the edge of the concrete, that's an instant kill. It doesn't matter how much health you have, and there's no swimming mechanics either, so the water acts as a bottomless pit. Also, there's a chance that Elisa will either fly off or get knocked off the stage by an enemy, and it doesn't matter how much AI or health she has in her database. You could spring yourself off the edge on purpose, which is kind of funny. I did it before, and yeah, it was hilarious, but... I enjoy knocking enemies off the edge of the, and into the water. That's actually fun. This level is very short, so just rinse and repeat like you did from the previous level and everything will be just fine. There will be segments like this in the future stages, so please be careful with your surroundings while fighting enemies. I like the machine gun that Lars was carrying. It's so useful. Each time you use a machine gun, it shoots 12 rounds of bullets, whether you position it at a straight line or you tilt it to offset running enemies. Tekken 6 is the first game that introduces the usage of items for fighting against opponents. In an actual Tekken game, certain characters have certain commands for their exclusive items, whether it's for attacking or just for show. In scenario campaign mode, the uses of those items are limited and sometimes optional. Using these items will KO the enemies faster. Certain levels have different types of items, whether they're long range or close range, and you'll run into them in future levels, so just be patient. You even know what kind of place you're stuck in your roles into here, Mr. Force Officer. All I know is that I just jumped into a pack of enemies. You sure you're Tekken Force? Guess it doesn't really matter. Your history, either way. Alright, so here's the new character in the arcade version of Tekken 6. Miguel Caballero Rojo. He's from Spain, and his fighting style is Brawler, which, to me, is actually the most threatening fighting style ever. Oh my god, I'm not kidding. And this is why Miguel is considered a power character in Tekken 6. Like, pretty much close to Brian. So, here's his story. Miguel lived his life as a lone wolf and detested the idea of answering to anyone. Despite being born into a conservative family, his wild and unruly nature made him a black sheep in the family. The discord between Miguel and his parents caused him to run away at the age of 15 and take residence at the bar owned by an acquaintance. In spite of his family dysfunction, Miguel kept in contact with his younger sister who he grew to trust and treasure. On the darker side, Miguel's overprotective concern for his sister was extreme. He almost wanted to kill her boyfriend when he heard the news that they were to be married. 
On the day of the marriage, Miguel was unable and unwilling to stand with his parents and participate in the service. Instead, he watched from the outside of the church. Looking around, Miguel noticed the sky was blue as far as the eye could see, and the planes overhead seemed to be serene part of the festivities. Then suddenly, a blast of intense heat engulfed the area. Miguel was knocked back and sustained intense pain throughout his body, but rushed to the church to search for his sister. When he found her, her dress was stained crimson red and air no longer filled her lungs. Miguel screamed echoed through the smoldering rubble that was once the church. After hearing that aerial attack that has been worked of the machines they bought to, Miguel gave in to the dark thoughts, loathing and hatred, and swore revenge upon Jinkazama. In the previous episode, do you remember Miguel's cutscene in the intro? It's very tragic. He lost his sister during the explosion. Poor guy. At least I feel his pain though. But the good thing is that it's our duty to do what's right. And we're not going to accomplish anything by just standing here and do nothing. So, let us proceed to our adventure. A group going by the alias Resistance appears to have taken up residence in the warehouse complex. Their mission objective is to channel all other machines I bought to, though their capabilities appear to be lacking. Now performing perimeter reconnaissance. Alright, Elisa's AI is level 2, and this is by far a good start. So, we have these two branched levels that are unlocked, and they're in the same area but above one another in the map. So, we're going to enter the closest level, which is the Container Terminal 3. We'll enter the level above the Container Terminal 3 level in the next episode. So, without further ado, let's proceed to our journey. Looks like a regular tanker to me. A large tanker like this is required to anchor offshore for safety reasons. It does not belong in the harbor. Meaning it must have had a different reason for entering the port. Correct. I have confirmed numerous readings within. Please be careful. I actually like how this level looks. It reminds me of Jack 2 stage in Tekken 2. The sky, the buildings, the atmosphere, the smoke. Yep, this level is very nostalgic, and I like it. But anyway, remember what I told you about the surroundings when you fight the enemies. In this level, most of the enemies are jacks and jack type robots who will slam you, shoot you, and push and shove you all over the place. In the background, you notice that the jacks are ascending from that boat over there. Like, you see it right there? and then they descend to your position. If you're standing below the jacks while they're landing, you'll take damage and get knocked down on the ground, and that's no good. The jacks can also knock you off the stage and into the water, so be careful. Just try to knock the jacks into the water and have fun doing that. When it comes to beat em up games like the snare campaign mode in Tekken 6, like this game here, I always enjoy KOing enemies off of edges and falling into bottomless pits and bodies of water. It's actually a fun concept that you want to raid through enemies and go havoc on them. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Well, yeah it is. That's actually the big objective when it comes to beat em up games. You just go crazy on all these enemies, beat em up, get a high score. You... Oh my god, I have so much stuff I could tell you about. This game is so much fun. Well, the snare campaign part, but there are some segments that I didn't like about this game, which I'll explain to you about that later. I 
just thought of something. I have to show you this clip. Did you notice something odd about it? Yes, that clip. That stupid jack robot stopped me from KOing that alien. Trash heap. He deserved to be destroyed because of it. Anyway, that's not the reason why I've shown you the clip. What you just saw before the jack robot appears was Lars and Lisa chasing a jumping alien. You'll notice that there is also an alien in the first level of the scenario campaign mode, which is Brian's level, and then dropped a few items when I KO'd it. These aliens act as bonus materials to assist you for dropping special treasures and scoring for better points. So when you see one or find an alien somewhere in the levels, chase after it or them and attack it or them. They appear in some of the levels in scenario campaign mode, but not all of them. Don't worry, they'll respond at the same spot if you restart the level. Okay, let's continue our progression. There's only one other thing about this level that's pretty special, but we're not there yet because we're pretty much halfway there completing the level. Plus, we haven't even come to the boss yet, and I guarantee you know who the boss is going to be. So yeah, unlike any other traditional beat em up game, all you have to do is just go from point A to point B just by beating up enemies and so forth. And that's just pretty much it. There are also enemies that are going to sprout from the water and then attack you. You could skip these guys, but you're going to have to beat them up if you want to get a better score. And like I said before, there are going to be some segments where something's going to be blocked unless you defeat the enemies. Well, you need to do something though. Alisa won't be able to fight those enemies by herself. Well, out of the game perhaps, but that's a different story. But still, you still need to beat these enemies up. That's the whole point of the scenario campaign mode. There's the Jacklight robot with the blue health. This is the spot I was talking about. The Jacks will continue to respawn unless the giant robot is defeated. If you allow the giant robot to live while you destroy the Jacks for a few minutes, the aliens will descend into the same spot and then try to jump around everywhere. It's an exclusive feature in this level that reminds me of survival mode in fighting games. But I won't be able to show you because Lars does not have enough health to survive the onslaught of these Jacks. So, I push the giant robot into the water and end the jacks respawning from the air. This one's different from the ones we fought before. Yes, its equipment surpasses that of the previous models. Then I guess we can't afford to take it easy. Time to go all out. Oh man, I remember I used to learn his wind up punch back in the other Tekken games. When it charges at max, then this punch is an instant kill. I remember I used to do that like pretty much every single arcade mode there is. Well, just the console versions. So, Jack 6 is pretty much interesting. His origin is unknown, meaning he doesn't have an actual country to live in. And his fighting style is brute strength. So, in his story, Jack 5 finished collecting fight data at the King of Iron Fist Tournament 5 and headed back to the G Corporation's laboratories. Jane used his data 
in her research to develop more sophisticated combat algorithms for him. While G Corporation was at war with the Mishima Zaibatsu, mass-produced jack units were deployed around the world. Unconfirmed reports claimed the Mishima Zaibatsu had begun manufacturing a copy of the jack unit designed for a large-scale massacre. Jane was angry that Jack was being imitated, so she sent in the more sophisticated model, Jack 6, in order to investigate the truth behind the rumors. So yes, all those Jacks that we've been fighting throughout um, this level, they're considered major copies. The one that Jane has, that's the final version. That's pretty much nostalgic if you ask me, but um, yeah. If you don't know who Jane is, well, I'll tell you. She's a blonde-haired female scientist who is the original designer of the Jack robots. Well, there's not really much details about her. She plays a minor role in the entire Tekken franchise. She's only involved in with the um, just creating Jack, and that's just it. So if she's working on Jack Six ever since the war started, then who's been creating the Jack robots that was that was attacking us? Well, we don't know. Well, I did say that Dr. Boscanovich was the one who created the robots, but um, I might end up contradicting myself if it isn't. Well, yeah, there's not really much complexity when it comes to both Dr. Boscanovich and Jane's story, but uh, yeah, I don't really think no one pays attention to this story. I guess they don't really care about that. They just want to play the game. If you're interested in the Tekken series, well, there's always the internet. You have all the free time you need to learn much more about the plots throughout the entire Tekken franchise, plus the characters that are participating in the tournament. A large number of robots exited the anchor tanker. They appear to be the property of the G Corporation, serial name Jack. These robots make me feel something akin to the human emotion called nostalgia. Most likely just an error on my memory banks. Any idea how the G Corporation was forcing these Jacks to attack us and the world? To me, I'm not really sure. I could be wrong, but maybe they thought we we're working for the Machines I bought to or something. Or even the Machines I bought to sold the actual data from the original Jack unit and then create armies of them in order to raid the world. Either way, the entire world is in jeopardy right now and we have to save all of these questions for later. Yeah, everything is complete mess right now, but this is only the beginning. And that concludes part 2 of Tekken 6. So in the next episode, we'll enter the level that was above the container terminal 3, and that is the Queen's Harbor. I'm pretty sure you'll know what upcoming boss is going to be while we enter the next level in the next episode. So, I'll see you guys then. And don't worry, I'm going to explain to you pretty much everything there is to know about Tekken 6, whether it's the gameplay, the story, or something else that I haven't even explained yet. Well, not too detailed though, because I just want to keep it simple. Alright, see you later.